Welcome to Conversations the World Over. I'm Raymond Arroyo. This new program is something very special. I've wanted to do it for a long time. It's a chance to revisit some of my most powerful conversations over the last 19 years as host of the World Over. As creator and host of the longest running live show at EWTN, I've been privileged, truly, to speak at length with some of the world's outstanding leaders, writers, artists, and true heroes. Our hope is that these conversations will shed new light on contemporary events and allow you a chance to experience these people as never before, perhaps for the first time. Tonight we bring you part one of an interview that remains a standout. Pope Benedict made history and stunned the world when he announced on February 11, 2013, that he would resign as Supreme Pontiff of the Roman Catholic Church. This was the first time in nearly 600 years that a pope had voluntarily abdicated the throne of St. Peter. A decade earlier, in 2003, we brought you my exclusive interview with the man who would become Pope Benedict XVI, then Cardinal Ratzinger. At the time, he had spent 22 years as prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and he was the second most powerful man in the Vatican. Cardinal Ratzinger had assiduously avoided interviews, and ours would become his first extended interview in English, and very likely his last. I remember meeting Cardinal Ratzinger alone in his office before we began our conversation. He asked me what we'd be discussing. My answer? Now, does the professor reveal the questions to the quiz or just the themes? He seemed to enjoy that answer, and after I gave him my list of themes, we were all set for the interview. It was to be conducted in Italian with a translator, and I pled with him to do at least the first three questions in English. He happily consented. And once we got going, he just continued on in English. The only exception was a brief Italian Bible quote. As you'll hear over the next two weeks, he reflected on his vision for the future of the church, the clerical sex abuse scandal, and the papacy of St. John Paul II. Ratzinger also spoke for the first time about his persistent desire to retire his office. And after his historic resignation, those words took on new meaning. So here is part one of my revealing conversation with the man who would become Pope Benedict XVI, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. First of all, Your Eminence, thank you for having us here, and uh, it's a great honor to be with you. In, In your book, God and the World, you talk about a crisis of faith. And you, more than anyone, should know the state of this church. You get reports every day. Where does this crisis of faith stand now? Are things improving? Yes, it's improving in a certain sense. Also, as the situations generally, I think the situation of the Western world is an increasing of relativism. Mm -hmm. The idea of all is uh, equal, and we do not know nothing of clear about God, and so all the faces are equal, and so on. Mm -hmm. This is a general impression in the world of today, and it's also a temptation for all the Christians. Mm -hmm. But I think, from the other hand, in many people is also a real desire to have uh, concrete uh, contact with uh, Christ, with uh, Mm -hmm. the presence of our Lord. So I would say in uh, uh, the use of the church is uh, improving the situation Mm -hmm. because they will not simply do what all people is doing, they will really uh, be in contact with the Lord and uh, uh, sharing the face of the church. So I would say generally the situation of Western world is not improving about the face, but mm-hmm. in the church and the use of the church, we can see that it's a new beginning. Signs of hope there yeah. that are, that are yes. being planted. Let's talk for a moment about the Second Vatican Council uh, and particularly the implementation of the council. You've written so much about this and talked so much about this. For people of my generation, I suppose the thing that most stands out from the faith of our fathers and grandfathers is the liturgy, the Mass. You have spoken about the reform of the reform, reforming the reform. How do you see that actuating? How do you see it concretely taking shape as we move forward? Generally, I would say it was not well implemented, the liturgical reform, because it was a general idea now 
liturgy is a thing of the community. The community is representing himself, and so with the creativity of the priest or of the other uh, groups, uh, they will create their own liturgy. It's mm -hmm. more uh, the presence of their own uh, experiences and ideas uh, than uh, meeting with uh, the presence of the Lord mm -hmm. in the church. And with this uh, creativity and the self-presentation of the community is disappearing the essence of liturgy because the essence is that we can uh, go uh, over our own experiences and receive what is not from our experience, what is a gift of God. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to restore not so much uh, certain ceremonies, but the essential idea of liturgy to understand mm -hmm. in liturgy we are not representing ourselves, but we uh, receive the grace of the presence of the uh, Lord with uh, the Church of the Heaven and of the Earth mm -hmm. and this universality of the liturgy is, it seems to me, the essential uh, mm -hmm. definition of liturgy and restore this idea will also help to be more obedient to the norms, not as a juridical positivism, mm -hmm. but really as a, a sharing, participating what is given to us from the Lord in the church. And that sense of sacrifice and worship that you've talked about uh, so elo eloquently, how do you see that being restored concretely? Will we see a return to uh, the ad orientum posture, facing the, e the priest facing away from the people during the canon, uh, a return to the Latin, mm -hmm. more Latin in the Mass? Uh, versus Orientum, I would say, could be a help because it's really a tradition from the apostolic time and uh, is uh, not only uh, a norm, but is expression also of the cosmical dimension and of the historical dimension of the liturgy. Uh, we are uh, celebrating with uh, uh, the cosmos, with the world. We mm -hmm. are in the direction of the future of the the world of our history represented in the sun and in the cosmical realities. Mm -hmm. I think uh, today with the new uh, discovering of uh, our relation with the created world mm -hmm. can be understood also from the people better than perhaps uh, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And also is a common direction, priest and people are in common oriented to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So I think it could be a help. Always the uh, external gestures are not simply a remedy in itself, but right. could be a uh, help because it's a, a very uh, classical interpretation of what is the direction of the liturgy. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, I think it was good to translate the liturgy in the spoken languages mm -hmm. because we will understand, we will participate also with our thinking. Mm -hmm. And so, but uh, a stronger presence of some elements of Latin would be helpful to give the universal dimension, to give the possibilities that in all the parts of the world we can see I am in the same church. Mm -hmm. So generally, uh, popular language is, uh, is a, a good, good thing. solution, mm -hmm. solution. But uh, some presence of Latin could be helpful to have more experience of universality. I know you are working on those new liturgical, uh, this new liturgical piece of legislation that the Pope previewed mm -hmm. in his encyclical on the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. We've been hearing a great deal from Cardinal Lorenze and, and in some publications that this may be a precursor to a universal indult for the Tridentine Mass. Do you foresee that at all? I would distinguish between this future document and the problem of the indult. The future document is not a new legislation, but interpretation of given norms. Okay. So uh, uh, we have only to interpret, to clarify what is abuse and what is really uh -huh. uh, uh, application of the liturgy. In this sense, it's very limited, the possibility of this document, mm -hmm. a clarification of abuses and clarification of norms mm -hmm. uh, in this moment. The other is a different problem. I think generally uh, the old liturgy was never prohibited. We need only norms how in peace 
uh, apply it so that the Reformed liturgy is the normal liturgy of the community of the church, but the author is always a valid liturgy of the church, can be used, but in obedience to the bishops and to the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. And that's a, tr a great challenge, I know, in some parts of the church and in other parts of the church. Uh, they've embraced uh, uh, the Pope's call for a more yes, frequent uh, yes. practice. Yes, I think it's mass. important to, to be open to this possibility and to uh, demonstrate so also the continuity of the church. We are today not another church as uh, 500 years ago. It's always mm -hmm. the same church and was in one time holy for the church. It's always holy for the church and it's not in another time an impossible thing. Right. Some have suggested, Your Eminence, that there is a de facto schism in the church today because many who call themselves Catholic, many who were born and baptized Catholic, simply don't believe nor live out the fullness of the faith. How do we bring them back? How do we reach them in this cultural yes. reality? Yes. I would say this is a permanent problem of pastoral to help that all people can really uh, shares the faith of the church authentically. Mm -hmm. And it was always a problem that the faith of many persons was deficient and insufficient. Mm -hmm. Today it is clear with all the uh, relativism, relativism and so its problem is stronger than in past times. Mm -hmm. And so the problem of catechization and evangelization is much more difficult as in different times. I think the first point is a good catechesis uh, that uh, in the preparation to the faith, in the education to the faith, really the faith of the church is in its authenticity present. Mm -hmm. And I think the catechism of the Catholic Church is a great help to see universally what is really faith of the church and what is not. Mm -hmm. And the new companion we are preparing will be mm -hmm. another help to make more accessible the great catechism in the a practical work of catechization. Mm -hmm. It's the first point, education in the face, in the face and have really uh, the common ground present. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other point is also the predication that in homilies we can really year for year learn what is the face, not only some or always the, the, the same ideas. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very real danger that in the homilies uh, priests and also bishops could repeat essentially the preferred ideas and not mm -hmm. present the completeness of the faith. Mm -hmm. So I think a renewal also of the predication is very important. The liturgy is uh, uh, living catechesis. Mm -hmm. I think so much is dependent from uh, uh, authentic liturgy, that in liturgy is not only, as I said, appearing the ideas, the experience of this community is a representation of the faith of the church. You can see the sacrifice of Christ is here and uh, the triune God uh, is in contact with us, we with him and so on. Mm -hmm. Liturgy is very important and so deepen also the prayer in the church. I think the way to learn God is pray. And uh, a school of prayers are very essential, I think, mm -hmm. that uh, in the uh, concrete relation of prayer, we learn God and we learn the church, and so it's important to have prayer books representing really the deepness mm -hmm. of our faith. So I think uh, even the works of Christian charity are important to con give concreteness to our faith because faith is not only an idea, mm -hmm. not only a theory, but, but it's a also reality. a living reality. Mm -hmm. And that experience, you know, ha having that experience, I think, and you talked about the Mass, mm -hmm. that that truly is the contact, if you will, between God and man yes. in such a powerful yes. way when, when yes. they interact. Talk for a moment about the new springtime. The Pope has talked a great deal about the new springtime, and you yourself uh, have uh, laid out your own ideas. Your vision is a little different from some. Some see the numbers growing and everybody believing and dancing hand in hand into the <laughs> millennium. You see a different picture. Tell us what that picture involves. How do you see this springtime evolving? Yes, I do not exclude even this dancing <laughs> hand in hand, but this is only one moment. And my idea is that really the springtime of the church will not say 
uh, that we will have uh, in the near time masses of conversions that uh, all people of the world will be converted to Catholicism. This is not the way of God. Uh, the essential things in the history begin always with, with small, more convinced communities. Mm -hmm. The church uh, begins with the 12 apostles. Mm -hmm. And even the Church of St. Paul, diffused in the Mediterranean, are uh, little communities. But these communities had in, it, uh, in itself the future of the world because mm -hmm. they had the truth and uh, the force of conviction. So I think also today it uh, should be an error, would be an error to think now in 20 10 years with the new springtime, all people will be Catholic. This mm -hmm. is not our future, not mm -hmm. our expectation. But we will have uh, really convinced communities uh, with uh, elan mm -hmm. of the faith. No? And uh, this is springtime. If new life uh, in very uh, convinced persons with the uh, joy of the faith. But no? smaller numbers. Uh, see, the smaller numbers, I think. But uh, from these small numbers, we will have a radiation of joy in the world mm -hmm. and so also an attraction. As it was in the old church, even when Constantine uh, made uh, public religion Christians, there are a small percent, percentage of this time, but mm -hmm. it was uh, clear this is the future. So we can live in the future. This gives us the uh, way in a different future. Mm -hmm. And so I would say if we have uh, young people really with the joy of the face and uh, with the radiation of this joy of the face, this will show to the world, even if I cannot share it, even if I cannot convert it in this moment, mm -hmm. here is the way to life for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Do you see the various movements in the church as part of that um, ongoing conversion? And is there a danger there that we get into this um, competitive factionalism, if you will, mm -hmm. in the church mm -hmm. that we all have to be a part of if we're going to be a serious Catholic. Yes, from the one hand, I am really a friend of the movements, Comunione Liberazione Focolarini, and so on, charismatic renovation. Mm -hmm. I think this is a sign of the springtime and of the presence of the Holy Spirit today who give new charisms and so on. This is for me really a great hope that uh, not uh, with organization from the authorities, but mm -hmm. really with the force of the Holy Spirit present in the people. In the people. Uh, we have movements and new beginnings of the faith, new forms of the faith. From the other hand, it is important that these movements are not closed in herself and absolutized, mm -hmm. but have to understand, even if I am convinced this is the way I have to accept we are one way and not the way, and we have to be open for the others in communion with the others, and essentially we have to be uh, really uh, present and even of obedient to the common church, the purge of the bishops and the popes, mm -hmm. only with this openness to not be absolutized with his own ideas and mm -hmm. to be in service of the common church, of the universal church, can be really a way for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Your Eminence, I want to ask a few <coughs> personal questions, if you'll permit me. You've written uh, most recently in, in the book, uh, God and the World. You've said and called this post as prefect of the, at the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith. You've said this is my most uncomfortable post. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Yes, it's in many senses uncomfortable. We have essentially and often to do with all the problems of the church, problem of the relativism, of the heresies, of uh, uh, inacceptable theologies, uh, difficult theologians, and so on. Also with the disciplinary cases, also problem of pedophilia is our mm -hmm. problem. Uh, we are really in this congregation confronted with the most difficult aspects of the life of the church today. And so also clearly attacked as the Inquisition and what you all you better sure. now than I, sure, sure. Uh, from the one hand. But from the other hand, I have to add to what I said in this book. I also have, uh, every day I would say, the experience uh, that people is thankful, is seeing, yes, the church has 
an identity, has a continuity. Uh, the faith uh, uh, is really present also today and is also today possible. And uh, when I go in St. Peter's Square and so on, I can see every day people from the different parts of the world knowing me and saying, thank you, Father. <laughs> uh, we are thankful that you are doing this difficult job because this is helping to us. Even many Protestant friends say to me, what you are doing is helpful also for us because it's mm. defending also uh, our faith and the presence of the faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. We need uh, an instance as yours, even if we are not sharing all what you are saying, mm -hmm. but it's also for us helpful to see uh, we have uh, this continuing uh, defense of the faith and this uh, encouraging to uh, continue in the faith uh -huh. and to live it. And in these days, an Orthodox delegation said to me, what you are doing is good, is also, also for us good. Yeah. So we have an ecumenical dimension not so often uh, appreciated. Uh, appreciated. Yeah. Your Eminence, uh, the other thing, I, 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 and this is a total personal appraisal, because of my post, and, and I, I cover the church, I travel about the world and talk to so many people, I'm sure nothing uh, approaching the groups of people that you talk to and the things you encounter. And I have to tell you honestly, recent days have been something of a trial of faith for me and I know for some of my colleagues. How do you weather what I'm sure is a temptation to despair at times, considering the cases you, you examine and the, the personalities you encounter at times? Yes. I think we have to remember that our Lord said to us that uh, in diciamo adesso in italiano, nel campo della chiesa ci saranno non solo grano. Within the fields of the church, there will be not only wheat but chaff. From the seas of the world you will take not only fish, but also unacceptable things. Therefore, he announces to us a community, a church in which scandals and sinners will be present. We must remember that St. Peter Prince of the Apostles, was a great sinner, and yet the Lord wanted precisely the sinner, Peter, as the rock of the church. Thus he has already indicated to us not to expect great saints of all the popes. We must also expect there to be sinners among them. He announces to us that in the fields of the church there will be much chaff. This sense should not surprise us if we consider all of church history. There have been other times, at least as difficult as ours, with scandals and so forth. All we have to do is think of the 9th century, the 10th century, the Renaissance. Therefore, Looking at the words of the Lord, at the history of the church, we can relativize today's scandals. We suffer. We must suffer. Because they, that is, the scandals, made so many people suffer. And here we are thinking of the victims. Certainly, we must do all we can to avoid that these things happen in the future. But on the other hand, we know that the Lord, and this is the essence of the church, the Lord sat at the table with sinners. This is the definition of the church. The Lord sits at the table with sinners. Therefore, we cannot be amazed if it is like this. We cannot despair. On the contrary, the Lord said, I am not here only for the just, but for sinners. We must feel certain that the Lord truly, even today, seeks sinners in order to save us. Mm -hmm. Let me know what you thought about tonight's show and which of our interviews you'd like to see in an upcoming edition of Conversations the World Over. You can always write me at raymond at raymondarroyo.com. The new show premieres each Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S. For those outside the U.S., go to EWTN.com for other airtimes. Next week, we'll bring you part two of my historic conversation with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. The conversations continue. Don't miss them. Bye now.